So our topic is dance body and decoloniality between practice and institutionalization. Presented by uh, Samson Akani, Faisal Muhammad, Maria Luisa Silva, Paturi Souza, and Sri Radha Paul. This panel is proposed by four international students from Nigeria, Brazil, Ghana, and India, who are currently in the Coriomundus program, International Masters in Dance Knowledge Practice and Heritage program. Coriomundus is coordinated by four partner institutions. University of Clermont-Ferrand in France, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, Norway, University of Seged, Hungary, and University of Roehampton, UK. These students bring diverse perspectives and examples to contribute to the ongoing discussion of decolonization of music and dance studies. And our abstract for this session is uh, the marks of colonialism are still evident in our contemporaneity. However, its manifestations have progressively become more complex. Through this collective endeavor, we aim to reflect on the shades of decoloniality in dance, mobilizing different contexts and situation from practice-based traditional to contemporary and institutional-based museums and academia knowledge by reflecting on the traditional concept of operation of the global south, we want to explore how that east-west power dynamics play out in certain ways that permit us to observe shifts from the center to the periphery. Departing from these reflections, the four presentations in this panel will show that decoloniality is a dynamic process which has the potential of creating dialogues to repurpose social equality. Hello everyone. My name is Sri Radha Paul. I'm from India and I'm an ODC dancer and a Koryamunda student. Today, my topic is deconstruction of classicism in ODC dance, a case study of a contemporary ODC dance choreographer. As a ODC practitioner and as a student of dance studies, I would like to define decoloniality by responding to classicism and margin marginalization of community practitioners. And when I say classicism, in that I would like to uh, mention uh, or give a brief historical overview on Odyssey dance, on the reconstruction of Odyssey dance. First, let me introduce what is Odyssey dance. Odyssey is an Indian classical dance, which is the classical dance of Orissa. As you can see in the map, it is on the Eastern part um, of India. The red part is Orissa. And Odisha dance uh, has emerged from the temple ritual practice performed by a special class of women known as Mahari or Devdasis or temple dancers. And Odyssey dance has also um, emerged from other dance forms like Gotipua, folk theater of Orissa, Sakhi Natya and other folk traditions of Orissa. These all total kind of helped in constructing Odyssey dance, which is the present classical Indian classical dance of India or Orissa. So before I mention, uh, like when I mentioned about classicism and I want to make myself clear uh, on what uh, ground I'm talking about uh, classicism. So for that, I like to mention this um, association uh, why, which was uh, very, which is very important to understand like from what context or on which context I'm talking about classicism in reconstruction of Odyssey dance. So here is Jayantika, which is an association that was formed in the end of 1950s among the male gurus, intellectuals, dance researchers and practitioners with the intent to systematize the practice and teaching of the Odyssey style. And for what? For the future generation of Odyssey dancers. And they kind of discussed the repertoire and technique 
and they did uh, fixed the dress code and everything was decided by them guidelines were laid down and let me tell you uh, this association all the members were predominantly male in the association all the deci uh, decision makers were male now comes the reason to make it classical post independence uh, before i even tell the reasons i would like to mention that there is no such classical uh, terminology uh, in terms of dance in indian language so this whole thing of classical indian classical dance is in a way um, is a western idea and probably why we needed to make this odissi dance as classical why can't these folk traditional forms be as it is why we need to borrow and make something new or construct something new probably maybe a legacy of colonialism is to gain the status of colonizers or give indian dance the status of western ballet there is another problem of reconstruction of odissi dance in 1950s is a concerted effort is being made to negate reconstructed odissi's roots in folk theater and uh, to add to that how all the old gurus have their background in folk theater but still they made it their conscious decision um, to negate the roots the roots in odissi dance the roots of the folk theater in odissi dance now i would like to share uh, to uh, give a uh, like which will give an idea who was this who were these maharis and how they used to live or how they used to dance what maharis would be like they were um you know when we talk of dance or is especially we always talk of uh, these maharis who danced and they being the the link the living link between now and what was jonna samandri chatcha chatcha niyog chatchi prakara seva kariya ta bhi to jo raja महाराजा हूँ प्रथम सेवक आंडा पशुपालक जहाँ को सिंगाड़ी कह जाए आईता स्वाड़ गड़ु पत्री गड़ु गरा गड़ु अन्न्य मान ये बहुत प्रकार सत्सान जो अच्छे महारी गोटे निज आम जगन्नाथ जगन्नाथ प्रतिनिधि जो महाराजा तर आम गुरु आम मंदिर परीक्षा परीक्षा अर्थ परीक्षक से जो महारी मैंने नृत्यकारिणी गोटे प्रकार अच्छा गाँवी गोटे प्रकार अच्छा से गाणी मैंने बड़ सिंह समय गाँवी नृत्यकारी मैंने सका दुपहर तेरा पड़ा बेले आम आगे नृत्य करती आम सुना बेत भंडार रू आसे आम सामने मादली मादल बजाती से मैने नृत्य करती ठीक तेरा जो बड़ी नैवेद्य आरंभ हुए महाप्रंगाड़ी आड़ की दक्षिण भाग रहे बियॉन्ड द हॉल ऑफ डांस एंड द असेंबली हॉल लाइज द इनर सैंक्टम दिस इज द वर्शिपर स्कूल वेयर द डिवाइन प्रेजेंस इज रिकॉग्नाइज्ड हियर द फूड ऑफरिंग वाज मेड ड्यूरिंग द मॉर्निंग रिचुअल एट नाइट द महारी सैंग एट द थ्रेशोल्ड इन हिंदू मेटाफिजिक्स द टेंपल प्लान रिप्रेजेंटेड अ माइक्रोकॉस्म ऑफ द वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर Outside the inner sanctum lay the world of nature. The divine presence was male, purusha. Nature was female, prakriti. Early thinkers said, nature or prakriti danced for the divine presence. Nagri gri gri thalal, taka diguna the, taka diguna the, taka diguna the. Sasi was one of the group of maharis who took turns dancing in the morning ritual. On her day to perform, she would fast and bathe, then approach the temple, veiled in a special shawl that was tied round her waist when she danced. So, uh, as you Uh, just saw how the maharis used to dance and um, 
and also how it, it used to be um, in the temple and what were the duties of the Maharis in the temples. Uh, so in this slide, um, excluding Maharis or temple dancers in the process of reconstruction of Odyssey dance as a classical dance. Scholar and Odyssey dancer Ratna Roy mentions how each Odyssey gurus claimed its origin in Mahari Nacho. But anthropologist Frederick Magling in Wives of the God King pointed how direct engagement or involvement of Mahari's temple dancers were consistently ignored in the process of construction of Odyssey dance as a classical dance. So here I would also like to point out that all the Maharis who used to dance in the temples were all female, they were all women. Now I would like to move from uh, the historical complicated uh, past on the reconstruction of Odyssey dance to the contemporary choreographers of present day Odyssey. So here I am saying contemporary choreographers, here I define uh, them, uh, like here I define the dancers who are not just transferring the knowledge from one generation to another generation, but also involved in the dance making process to, uh, and also contributing uh, to say their own narratives through dance. Some contemporary Odyssey dancers are responding consciously to include folk traditions and theater in the present day Odyssey dance productions. Sharmila Biswas is one of the choreographer whose grounded knowledge in Odyssey dance and folk traditions of Orissa helped her to blur the line between folk traditions and present day Odyssey. This is visible in most of her works and remarkably in Dhulikhel and Sutra. So this is just the definition of contemporary choreographers, which I just mentioned not just transferring knowledge from one generation to the next, but involving in the dance making process where the practitioners are the owners of their dance and narratives. So this, is, uh, this slide is about the artist, Sharmila Biswas, who is a noted Indian classical dancer and choreographer in Odyssey dance and a disciple of Guru Kekelu Charan Mahapatra, founder and artistic director of Odyssey Vision and Movement Center in Kolkata. She supported the young dancers to voice against pay and perform system by organizing program to support young artists. In 2012, Bishwas was awarded Sangeet Natak Academy Award, which is a very prestigious award in India. All these informations are retrieved from her website. And uh, I got uh, to interview her a few times and uh, got the opportunity to, do, uh, to attend one workshop under her and attended several lecture demonstrations. So all this experience together uh, helped me uh, to gather this information about her work and her approach of um, um, her work, her approach, um, Sharmila Biswas's approach on Odyssey is a bit different. This slide I have already shown to you before, but here she's uh, going backward to because of her interest on the origin of Odyssey dance. So she is looking back and seeing all the folk traditions of Orissa and studying. And most importantly, she studied, she researched um, very closely with uh, on Mahari, on the temple dancers. And one of our production is on the temple dancers on Mahari named Sampurna, that is in 1997. Sharmila has worked closely with the two last Maharis or temple dancers. Their names were Shashimani and Parashmani Mahari of Jagannath Puri temple in Orissa. She performed with Shashimani Mahari on stage. And you can see the pictures that she is interacting with them and performing. Working with the temple dancers, temple to stage. Sharmila's research in 1994 dealt with the temple rituals performed by the Maharis, temple dancers in temple, the thoughts and feelings of Maharis. And she staged this dance production with Shashimani Mahari in 1997. So here I would like to share like how uh, the Mahari is moving out of the temple from temple to stage directly. Then in 2006, a documentary film was made 
the Maharis of Orissa based on the compilation of rare pictures and video footage of her fieldwork. So here in this discussion, I would like to give uh, my findings, uh, talk about my findings and some remarks, how she created space by giving visibility to the marginalized practitioners by imbibing Mahari Nacha, the temple dancing, and different folk traditions in her present day Odyssey dance productions. And Sharmila making a conscious effort to change costume from stitch costume to draped costume. She has adapted the costume from the Maharis of Puri Jagannath temple to use for regular Odyssey performances. So as uh, you can see that in Jayantika, in that association in history, which was in 1950s, there were like some rules already fixed about the codes and the dress codes of the dancers. But here she's again going back to the temple and um, giving voice to the silenced uh, community because these Maharis were not even involved while um, the whole reconstruction process of Odyssey was happening in 1950s, they were very much alive and they were the practice was very much uh, not fully alive, but they were uh, practicing it. They were there in the community and uh, but still no one um, invited them uh, in the process or contribute in the process of reconstruction of Odyssey. But she went back and she did research and uh, and she made some changes in her costume and adapted the costume from the temple dancers of the temple. So, and also her works respond to the rules and codified structure made by the powerful elite class or men to carve out path for women dancers. So in this, how, like how the control, like how this kind of policies kind of control the woman dancer's costume, like how the woman dancer should cover their body or what should look nice on them. Then the second point is about the restriction of the movement of woman bodies, like what looks dignified and not. So this whole concept can bring uh, the whole Nehruvian concept, uh, which kind of, you know, there was a struggle uh, post-independence, how to make the perfect structure or how to make the codification. And uh, this kind of affected um, a lot for the many community practitioners because the edit class or the people uh, who were kind of um, British educated Indians, I would say, or the elite class with power, um, or men, they uh, portrayed women bodies based on their um, thought process or based on their idea of what looks dignified or what looks nicer, uh, what looks nice and what looks dignified. And in this also, I would like to say that the whole idea of being dignified or imbibing with the social and uh, moral culture of the colonizers is still like going, it's still an ongoing process. And I think her work in a way responds to these kind of questions. Some of the highlights, decoloniality is a complex phenomenon. Uh, as a practitioner, I, I feel that it is very complex to address from one perspective and it can be viewed from different perspectives in this context. This discussion is the beginning to reflect and review the reconstructed past of Odyssey dance. Here, Sharmila's work with Mahari temple dancers engage, engages dialogues in responding to classicism as a residue of colonialism. And her works kind of strengthen the voices to fight against the deep rooted patriarchy. Concluding questions, even though her works question to the hegemonic powers, but her approach in present day Odyssey can invite new forms of challenges. The asymmetry in power relations in terms of execution, production, folk practitioners, Odyssey classical practitioners, cultural policymakers and patrons cannot be ignored. 
So here you can see uh, that even now in India, the status of an Indian classical dancer and the status of a folk practitioners are not necessarily on the same plane. So even whatever the communication is happening, there is still an asymmetry, asymmetrical power relation is still working uh, in the whole system. So some questions are unsolved and uh, who is decolonizing, like who is decolonializing? And, uh, and I totally relate to this uh, as a practitioner, like who is decolonializing this Odyssey dance and for whom? and who benefits from this conversation. So this, I think I got inspired from, uh, I would like to cite Nritta Pillai uh, from uh, her, I kind of thought uh, like from her, um, I got inspired to write this and it's very relevant being a practitioner. And uh, with this note, I would like to conclude my presentation. And this is my bibliography. And thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you so much for listening um, to our first presentation. And uh, we will take questions uh, later at the end of the session. So we have our next presenter, Maria Luisa. So Carlos, would you uh, please share her presentation? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Luisa. I am from Brazil, and I'm also a Coriomundus student. And today, in my presentation, I will be talking about decentralizing museum narratives through performance. First, uh, the object of this presentation is first to discuss the connections between performance, activism, museums, and decolonization. And to discuss this, I will be using some recent examples uh, in the UK. And I also would like to highlight that this is an ongoing research and my intention is much more to create a ground for discussions through my descriptions and reflections than offer solutions to the problems that I will be touching here. And to make it clear from which place I am talking and how I formulated the, the topics that I will discuss here, uh, I would like to describe very briefly my research trajectory. So currently in my master's dissertation, I am studying the inclusion of dance and performance in museums, and more specifically, how participatory arts can create new narratives for museum collections. To develop this research, I went to Belgium, and in there I could follow many different performances made in collaboration with museums. And this performance included theater, dance, and traditional music and dance as well in different types of museums, contemporary art museums or modern art museums, etc. Uh, but none of these investigations, they had uh, the aim to discuss issues related with decolonization. However, uh, as someone interested in museum studies, I could not deny the urgence of addressing the legacies of colonialism inside institutions that hold the power to produce knowledge. And of course, museums are in the center of that discussion, and they are suffering an inside and outside pressure towards an understanding of how imperial and colonial violence has been conceptualized and perpetuated through imperial and colonial collecting, curatorial decision making, and museum display practices. So my main question for this presentation will be, how can performance especially dance or movement oriented, engage critically with colonial collections in museums and discuss issues related with the legacy of the colonial history. And I will be discussing this question through two, two types of performances. First, performance in collaboration with museums, so performance made inside the museums, and also through performance created by independent artists, and that in this case, we can also call as a activist performance. Uh, and to discuss this first type of, type of performance, I will be using some South Asian dances inside ethnographic museums in the UK. And to discuss performance created by independent artists, I will be use one example uh, of a film called A Very British Museum, directed by the dancer and choreographer Sita Patel. 
So basically, I will be discussing performing inside the museum and performing outside the museum and how these both, we can say, fields, they can create dialogues with the decolonization. So first, dance inside museums. Uh, my aim here was to understand the framework and concept behind the realization of performance inside the museum. And to, to investigate that, uh, it's important to say that because of the pandemic situation, I could not visit any museum or could not experience by myself any performance inside any museum in UK, although I, I am already here. But I did uh, research in museums' websites, and also I did two interviews with one curator of a big ethnographic museum in UK and one dancer who, ha who have worked with one project very recently. It was a photo shooting and performance project. So dance inside museums, analysis of the material. Uh, through the interview with this curator that is currently, uh, this person is not currently working uh, in the museum, but this curator have been working with many different performances and especially South Asian performance inside museum. And through this interview, I could notice some keywords that can explain the main concept behind this performance. And they are, it's beautiful and bringing life to the museum. So we can see that there is a very aesthetic appreciation of these events. And this is, I can say that through this interview is the main point. And also uh, the idea of bringing life to the museum and engage the audience, bring a new experience to the museum. Uh, and through these examples, I could notice that dance is not questioning the museum in relation to its colonial legacies. And let's see the dancer perspective. Uh, so that dancer, she's an OGC dancer and she's from India and she's now based in UK. And she had a very interesting narrative about this, uh, these projects. And she said, if through my dance and my body, I am able to connect then the audience with the sculptures there or the stories that are there, that would be very important for me, to me. Uh, so she had a very, somehow a very positive narrative about it. Uh, but later in the interview, she mentioned, for me, it was very absurd in a way when we were taking into the other sections other than the Indian. They said, just do some random movements. And I was, why? I could not connect it connect with other exhibitions. Uh, I asked this dancer uh, which exhibitions they were taking in, and she said she's not sure. She doesn't remember really well, but she, they visit many different exhibitions and she has very clear uh, the Greek exhibition. So uh, what reflections we can take from these interviews? Uh, first, that dance in these cases is not interrogating the museum in relation to its colonial legacies. Uh, second, there is a very, uh, the main point here, it seems to me, uh, an aesthetic appreciation and also uh, the valorization of the public experiences uh, in the museum. And third, through this comment of this, the last comment of this dancer, we can uh, question if, is the museum promoting cultural essentialism through this performance that is? Uh, is the museum creating a, a kind of a uniformization of these dances or these cultures in the Easter, East culture? And Said can translate this uh, in a very interesting way in his book, uh, Orientalism, when he says, the Orient is a stage on which the whole East is confined. So, and dance, dancing outside the museums. As I said, I will be using one example of this film, A Very British Museum. Uh, this is a very uh, short summary of the film. A Very British, British Museum is a short film that is challenging places like the British Museum in terms of their role in looted history. Uh, the main creator of this film is Sita Patel, but they also have a creative team. Uh, first, I would like to introduce a little bit the, the main creator, Sita Patel. Uh, she is an award-winning choreographer and dancer. She was born in London and got trained in Bharatanatyam, uh, a classical Indian dance form. Uh, 
And her work is very diverse and include experiences with contemporary dance, dance theater, and film. And through her website, uh, I could see this information that for her, it's very important to use the creativity to challenge othering for a more equitable society, socially conscious, conscious action, discourse, and provocation to address wider global issues. So now I would like to show uh, a short a trailer of the film and then we can discuss better later. So after watching the, the short trailer, we can discuss now the visual journey and proposal of the movie. As you could observe, uh, the movie brings three main characters. And the aim of this film, according to Sita Patel, is to recreate the museum a museum exhibition using three bodies as a metaphor to discuss how museum portrays the other. And the film discusses in a very artistic way many relevant points for the decolonial agenda, such as repatriation, the colonial gaze, the terminology used by museums, and the division of lands by colonial administrations. And for this presentation, and in order to create a parallel to what I just discussed while talking about dance inside the museum, I would like to highlight the way that the, fi the film criticizes the representation of the other or the exotification of non-Western cultures. So strategies to disclose the colonial gaze. Uh, the film uses many different strategies to discuss and show off the colonial gaze through movement, projections, and narration. Uh, through the disposition of the movement and the movements of the three bodies, the film explores stereotypes and common images. The white body appears doing expansive movements. The black body almost does not show its face and it's always performing movements that remember pain and constraint. The female brown body is carrying its traditional custom that will be later taken from her in the film. For me, the relevance of this production is to show to a broader audience the museum as a political institution with a long history rooted in the colonial ideology. In other words, the museum cannot be seen as a neutral place to discuss history and culture. Uh, this is a, a small part of the interview that I had with Sita Patel when we were discussing about uh, how the film tried to, port to portray this, uh, what she will call the white gaze. And about this, she says, this is the white gaze, this sort of trauma. That's how we see people. That's how the museum portrays this sort of thing. That's how it is erased by the museum. That's how they are showing paintings. And when we were talking about the representation of the black body in the film and how uh, this character doesn't show its face very well, she said, we don't have humanity attached to it because that's what we do. And now I'm going to my conclusion, uh, dialogues between inside and outside and when dance is the colonial. So through this presentation, I discussed uh, different kinds of performance in museums uh, that create dialogues with museums, uh, dance inside museums through examples of South Asian dances and independent productions uh, that create uh, a dialogue with how the, uh, how the museum is creating their exhibitions. And the examples here they brought, uh, brought in this presentation, they are very asymmetrical and can show interesting tensions. And then I would like to put these questions how to create dialogues between inside and outside museums? And what are the different agendas involved in artistic works dialogue with museums? And finally, 
my main question, and I would like to come back to it and put for us to discuss, can dance inside the museum engage with the decolonizing agenda? These are my reference, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Malu. And so now uh, we'll move on to our uh, last presentation, and uh, it will be presented by Faisal and Samson. So, um, Carlos, um, okay, could you? Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Continue, continuing the discussion on decoloniality, we present um, an example from the Nigerian perspective, Nigerian West African perspective. My name is Faisal Mohammed, and and my name is Samson Akani. So our topic today is Afro contemporary dance practice, dialoguing decolonization from an artistic perspective. First of all, we'll be providing a little context to dance in Nigeria. We will be picking it from the post-colonial period when new traditional dance styles started or took fame. So what is new traditional dance? New traditional dances are traditional dances that have been taken out of their original context and have been repackaged for the stage. And we have the likes of late Ubat Ogunde who started the theater practice of taking traditional dances onto the stage, music, dance, and drama, basically. And currently, we have the likes of Shegwandi Fila and Shiu Awubajo, who still continue this practice until today. On the other hand, we have Afro-contemporary dance practice also, which are the new dance forms that draw from today's technology to represent the African heritage and reality. And among these people, are Dayo Liadi, Abdul Unibasa, and Kudus Unikeku. Kudus Unikeku is our subject for today's discussion. So who is Kudus Unikeku? He is a Nigerian, born in 1984. He studied circus art in France. And of course, he is a dance artist and a choreographer. He has been active since 2004 until date. And his organization is called the People's Center. He is very famous for dance gathering, which happens in Lagos almost every two years. And um, it basically features several dance artists from all over the world. Over 2,000 participants have been recorded to be in this dance gathering. And his major styles are hip hop, capoeira, tai chi, and contemporary. So we will be presenting a short video from Mr. Kudus Unikeku. This name of this dance piece is called the Rainmakers. Rainmakers in this context is a wizard or a babalao who attempts to cause rainfall through ritual practices like incarnation, music and dance fused together. And this production Rainmakers was created for the opening of the third global held in Arusha, Tanzania in August, 2017. This dance slash music video piece is about a fictional band of misfits, rebels, and nomads, not all from the same creed or nation, but who collectively build one unique tribe of like-minded individuals who want to be catalyst for change as drought encompasses their lands and communities. The tribe seeks to bring back the water with their bodies and souls. They go wherever they they go wherever there hasn't been rain and shake things up with their music, songs, and dances until rain pours. So now we will play this short video for everyone to see. So we want to um, go into the methodic, methodological and the conceptual framework that guides um, Onikuku's art work and his dances. So we pick this idea from his dance training where he conceptualized the ideas that move to the, 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 the dance as a product for um, production or for staging. So we consider Onikuku's dance technique as a framework of thought and action within which he and his trainees make creative dance decisions through what he consider the radical and necessary act of remembering to create dances that centralizes Yoruba philosophy and African realities. Basically what we, um, 
consider here is um, Onegoku's um, pick his ideas, his inspiration from Yoruba philosophies. He goes deep into the Yoruba traditional knowledge system, the symbols, the ideas, the realities of the Yoruba society itself in order to conceptualize his dances to create and then perform for the audience. And we think that his ideas parallels with the concept of Afrocentricity, which is a paradigm that asserts the central role of the African subject within the context of African history. This um, concept was propounded by the renowned professor Molefi Kitasanti that emphasizes on centering the African within his ideas, within his world, by shifting, it, uh, shifting him away from Western epistemology, Western notions of defining the African. So we consider that Onikoku's methodology and the way that he conceptualized and goes about his artistic work can be a starting point to understand how an individual is using dance um, to understand decolonizing through moods of uncovering knowledge system creating through discussing and with his um, trainees and disseminating how the mediums, the ways that he disseminates his artistic work and ideas. So um, we pick the, 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 the concept or his training and technique as a site for discussing um, decoloniality. This is where we want to go into his world of thinking and the ways that he approaches um, decoloniality. We saw that um, he uses the idea of disembodying and embodying, or what we can um, loosely call learning and relearning as a transformational process that deconstructs the dancing body by subjecting it to constraints. So one of the techniques that Onikuku uses is constraints. He uses um, this idea or this concept to immerse or immerse the, the training or the trainee, the African dancer, into series of techniques, series of processes from forcing it to realize certain ideas. So he subjects the, 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 the dancer to think about things that are related to Yoruba costumes, Yoruba customs, Yoruba ideas, Yoruba philosophy. Um, his movement techniques are quite um, difficult to realize in a way that subjects the dancer to this sort of um, energetic, this difficult mood of um, learning about new ideas, understanding his own self. And then through constraints, there's um, this element of restriction and limitation as what he considered a radical act to create new kinds of freedom. So what he believes is that when the body is subjected or the African body is subjected to, or is immersed in these new realities that um, the, the dancer is, not used to, he goes through this process to learn and um, new ideas that are African oriented. So for him, this process of immersing the African through um, um, constraints creates new ways of thinking, new ways of moving and new ways of acting. So one of the, um, the some of the process that he uses are uh, improvisation. He uses a lot of repetition. He uses um, paroxysm, um, strength, schizophrenic movement, which basically means um, the dancer um, kind of go through mode of um, thought or mode of ideas that are quite different. Um, it's a, for example, um, schizophrenic is a mental, um, mental condition that makes the person um, see things differently or make one believe things differently. So in his, in his um, artistic work, you could see individuals Re, um, reacting or responding to this idea of schizophrenic. And also he uses frenetic dance movement, which are more energy centered and fast in order to uh, represent these um, ideas of um, African centered movement and African centered ideas in his um, artistic work. And again, <clears throat> in his um, training, we also look at his, the way he conceived his training center, how he organizes um, his training center. So he, he, he established the, what he called the Q Dance Center in 2014. And up to 2019, he changed the name to the People Center. And this idea of changing the name was a systematic approach across the time from 2014 to remaking it or rebranding to the People Center was to make dance open and accessible, inclusive for all. 
So as um, you could see from the video, we are, the, um, the dancers were, in, in, we included differently abled um, personnel and also abled um, individuals who came together to conceptualize this um, dance form using um, Yoruba ideas and Yoruba philosophy to come out with this creative piece that represents their realities within the Nigerian um, cosmopolitan society. And also um, the dance center, he conceived it as a space for collective discussion that invites different voices, different ideas, emotions, and perspective in order to conceptualize and create the dance forms that he communicates to his audience. So I'll be talking about the three objectives or the three broad objectives of his company, which is called the People Center. So one is performance, the other is training, and the last is job creations. So on one hand, there are several artistic creations that has been performed and all over the world and taken on tour by this particular dance company. And we will see the list very soon. Um, on the other hand, there is the talent development. He has given several dancers from the street of Lagos. He has given them several opportunities, giving them the avenue to groom their talent and become good people to the society. And by doing this, in a broader or a wider perspective, is actually building the community, is creating jobs for individuals, taking them off the street. So these are the three basic um, or three broad objectives of this company. <clears throat> so now I'll be providing a first-hand knowledge or I'll be providing my own reflections after working with Kudus Enikeku. So um, my background is in, um, I did, uh, I took, several dance class. I lived in Lagos, Nigeria, which is a very cosmopolitan city. So we were opportune to work or to train under several dance scholars from all over the world. So I took classes in ballet, modern dance, salsa, ballroom dance forms, like the Latin and the standard. So I did waltz, Viennese waltz, a little bit of tango. I took cha cha classes, rumba, jive, samba, and all of that. So um, there was an audition by Mr. Kudus Onikeku and um, I did this and I got in and I got this opportun opportunity to work with him. And what was different or what was what took my attention at first was the fact that it centralizes the Yoruba philosophy and aesthetics in his discussion and freestyle sessions. So we usually have a long hour dance session, which is usually from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. And then what it does is that it sort of constrains the body. So you who are used to, you know, moving extensively, creating lines with your body, flying all over the stage, or you are used to moving in a certain way, it sort of gives you constraints. So it could tell you, you know what? Whatever you do now, stay on bent knees and just move, keeping this bent position. So in this way, you sort of think of new possibilities for your body to move. It could also tell you, be on, be on this spot or be in this particular position or move in spiral. Or, you know, it gives you certain tasks and then in doing this task, your body discovers new possibilities of moving and it allows you to move for as long as possible. And of course, there is always that conscious effort to use original music, either live in the rehearsal process or other recorded African songs. And of course, he also uses the concept of um, in Rome, which is the Yoruba um, idea of spectacle by saying that and we could talk about the importance of the Yoruba people, the importance the Yoruba people attach to visceral body movements, acrobatics, and magic displays as a means of securing attention and thereby influencing both the human and the divine. So there is this conscious effort to retain the Yoruba understanding of aesthetics by using strong, energetic, visceral body movement. So this is what sort of sets Mr. Kudus apart in his rehearsal process, which I experienced. So um, I'll be giving a few of his um, dance productions to use to portray or buttress this point. Iyami was um, a production he did in 2018. He sort of places the Yoruba concept of motherhood in the center of this particular piece. He also did Yoruba, Yoruba, which is the combination of the word Yoruba, which is a tribe in Nigeria, and Europe putting it together to create a particular piece to um, discuss the issues of people who are willing, um, trying to run away from Nigeria to discuss some community and um, political issues, basically. Then also he did another production called Abiku, again, centralizing the Yoruba philosophy of the spirit child. 
who comes to the world to create destruction and all of that. And of course, recent currently is taking on tour his production called Reincarnation, which is Atumbi, basically the Yoruba um, philosophy of um, or understanding of the world, the cosmology, the cosmos, um, believing that there is the word of the living, the word of the um, dead, and the word of the unborn. And this theory or this idea that when a, a, an old man dies, he might decide to come back through to the same family, through his child or something like that. So there is this old discourse around this issue of reincarnation, which is particularly, of course, reincarnation is, is worldwide. Several nations have this concept, but he puts the Yoruba's understanding of it and interpretation of it into his piece. There are so many other works like An African Ballet, Iwalewa, African Man Original, Mad House, Flash, Still Life, and My Exile is in my head. So um, to conclude or to draw this discussion to an end, uh, we've tried to highlight some of the ideas um, that Onikuku um, uses to guide his interpretation of Yoruba realities in his um, artistic work. So as we can see, um, he taps into the age-long Yoruba philosophies, which already neatly outline the part of the self, of authority, of the commune, and of the divine in his imagination and the realization of his dance piece. So with such a skill and talent and experience, he has been able to gather and exercise through his practice, um, different ideas and concepts that really reinforces his person um, as a Nigerian, as an African and as a Yoruba. And he uses this also to um, help train others and send them to the community, to the world, to also propagate these ideas of um, the African-centered um, um, real realities. So he takes from his diverse sources of aesthetics and transposes them into the contemporary and the urban um, context. So as we um, introduce in our discussion as an Afro-contemporary artist, um, what sets him apart from other um, con Afro-contemporary artists is his conscious um, and um, radical um, approach of letting the African um, dancer go through this transformational um, stage or transformational process by subjecting it to constraints, forcing it to uh, identify new ways of seeing um, himself or herself that are governed through the Yoruba realities and Yoruba philosophies. And this makes him one um, of an important artist that he is in the process or he is continually using his art form to discuss um, issues of decoloniality. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So um, now we are ready. We would like to take some questions. And I see in the chat that Emmanuel already have a question for me. So, yeah. so as a practitioner, I, I would like to um, answer Emmanuel's question. And as a practitioner, I feel that, what is your take on the appropriation of Indian? Okay. So uh, this whole concept of appropriation uh, can be related to, um, you know, it's a form of um, idea of colonization. And uh, especially when it comes to India, uh, Indian dance, because this Indian whole classical dance is a mix of uh, religious and uh, a bit of nationalism, then regional chauvinism and um, then a mix of national revivalism. So when this kind of dance is presented and kind of fused with uh, uh, different other dance forms, which doesn't align to the uh, whole vocabulary of the Indian classical dance, then it can, can offend uh, the traditionalists uh, who are practicing uh, for ages in India. So it, it is a very individual choice uh, how um, or in, to what extent um, this cultural appropriation can be done. And to me as a practitioner, uh, if, if I see it as a creative process and I would like to focus on the aesthetics um, and uh, I wouldn't go uh, like to that line of colonization. Uh, but also uh, to your second question, I want to, where, where is it? Okay, uh, to your second question, I want to uh, focus uh, to what extent do you classify such appropriation as colonization? So when I talk about this, it's just not colonization, Emmanuel. Uh, for me, it is the agencies, the different agencies, how it determines 
what will be the context of dance and how you know because it's the agencies in a way which is determining the grants which is coming uh, for south asian dancers in outside india or the festival which is coming um, or how they are portraying indian dance so all these things plays a role um, to answer uh, or to get a conclusion um, uh, to speak about cultural appropriation in indian dance so i hope uh, i answered it or Emmanuel, you can, if you have any further questions. Yeah, thank you very much um, for that answer. I think it clarifies um, the issues. My only problem was that um, <clears throat> um, there is danger of pushing for authenticity um, in a world that is um, uh, crying for creativity. There is a lot of creativity also in traditional dances, yes. But, but um, at, at times I just feel that maybe we we kind of... You're scared <laughs> of homogenizing. <laughs> things. I, I, I've loved dances by Zimbabwe, Indian dances by Zimbabweans, but I wasn't very sure if they're being authentic, you know. Yeah, but it, I think it's uh, related to also, you know, your idea that, okay, because they're Zimbabweans, so it is also your having a second thought to accept I have not seen their dance, but maybe as they are not Indians, and so you're having a second thought and have passing a judgment that whether they're doing it uh, correct or not. Uh, so I think it's not uh, something that we can directly approach um, there. And uh, we need to think because it's a very complicated process and, and there is no such cultural policing, you know, the, like whom will you say that don't do this and do that? So. It's, it's also an individual take and yeah. And in my topic, in my presentation, I speak how she's going back to the traditional folk art forms who were silenced during the reconstruction process. So she is in a way trying to create visibility um, which was in a way uh, decaying during the reconstruction process of Odyssey to have that classical status, which is the whole idea of the colonization. Anyway, so I have more questions, so I need to move oh. forward. And thank you for such amazing question to start with. Uh, okay. uh, maybe another, I can give you a breather. So um, I could quickly answer Emmanuel's, um, or um, not Emmanuel's. Okay. Let me... mm -hmm. oh. Sorry, I'm trying to I assess the question. I oh. Can Faisal, okay, there is a question for Faisal. By Su Bengtang, so... Um, it, his question is, thank you everyone for enlightening presentations. I have a question regarding the decolonization of Odyssey and Nigerian dance. Nigerian dance, what is Nigerian dance? Uh, do these dance projects benefit the traditional dancers and community who practice these dances and how? Um, first of all, Q Dance, I said that his company is meant for three basic projects, um, three basic ideas, one artistic creation, second, community development, and third, talent development. I wouldn't say traditional dances, like traditional dancers as such, but his intention or his main objective, one is to centralize the Yoruba philosophy. And in doing this, it brings young artists, talented um, people, it, it trains them. So in doing this, is somehow building the community, is helping. And also in putting the Yoruba philosophy in the center of his work is, you know, contributing to um, putting uh, these uh, ideas, these values by this particular tribe in Nigeria, putting it in the center and showing it to the world in present day. And I wouldn't say um, traditional dancers because his work, I wouldn't categorize it under traditional dance. So even if it's not directly benefiting traditional dances, it's benefiting the country, it's benefiting the young people, it's building the community, giving, taking people off the streets, giving them jobs. And these are the ways it benefits. And to um, Emmanuel's question, there's always this, um, this idea of, um, which is, you, you were talking about something about schizophrenic. I would let Faisal answer that question, but I just want to quickly tell you something. There's something Kudus tries or consciously does, is that it tries to translate most of these Yoruba terms into English so it can reach a wider audience. So there is, there is, a, there is a relative or there is a, there's a term that is very close to schizophrenic in the Yoruba um, vocabulary. And, that, and this idea of possession, this idea in Shango, in Oya, in all these gods, there is uh, always this idea of being possessed. And that is very similar to schizophrenic, seeing things that are not there, saying things that are not necessarily there. 
So you sort of bring the Yoruba spirituality again to the center. But I'll let Faisal um, answer that. Well, I guess you have already touched on that. So schizophrenic here is like it's closely related to uh, it's um, how do I even call it? The close English translation for it to understand because when it is put in the Yoruba terminology, it does not necessarily mean the English word. This is the problem that we tend to you know um, come across when you're trying to let the wider audience understand a certain concept. So um, as you know, um, the African dance, the Nigerian dance is spiritually centered. You understand? Traditional dance cannot, you cannot do. Dance is quite, dance is very important for the community and it is deeply entrenched in spirituality. So schizophrenic here um, tries to capture the idea of hearing voices, hearing things that you know, um, you, you, yeah, you can't see. So how do you realize this in dances? That is what you know, Onekuku tries to you know, realize in his dance practice. So as you could see, um, dancers on stage will be making certain gestures that symbolizes or that sort of depict the idea of schizophrenic, but it is not necessarily the same as the mental condition of schizophrenia that we are trying to capture here. Thank you very much. Have we, um, Sue Bentang, are you um, satisfied or you would like to dive deeper into your question? I was think it... I would like to add to what you said because uh, mm -hmm. it's very different uh, um, from, uh, I mean, ODC dance context is very different uh, from the Nigerian dance context uh, in a way. I know there is no such uh, dance form as Nigerian dance, uh, but uh, yeah. So in what way, because my presentation kind of speaks about it, like, okay, people are working with folk artists, but um, when they are negotiating, even when they're working with the folk uh, artists in their classical dance production, uh, but they're, they're, uh, nego while they're negotiating, the, they are not in the same plane because in Indian dance, the folk dance practitioners and the status of the classical dancers are not even closer to equal. So uh, when they are doing in a way visibility, but at the same time, they are taking, uh, they're doing some workshops for a month and they're learning those uh, dance steps and then they're deconstructing those steps and they name it as imbibing or they're stylizing those particular steps of from those folk tradition and then they're deconstructing it and using it into a one hour Odyssey dance production. And they are, have a, they are printing uh, big banners and invitation cards naming a uh, whole one hour Odyssey dance production. Whereas uh, when they're writing for a grant, probably maybe uh, they are writing that, okay, this is a collaboration between the folk artist and Odyssey dance together. But in the invitation card, you will always find that it is a Odyssey uh, dance production and they will be using folk music and folk tradition. Why? Because I feel one of the, uh, one of the reason might be uh, like maybe to, sh to show the audience something new, like something very different. So it can be one of the uh, idea because we are all artists and we always want to show something new and we want to create. But at the same time, uh, it is also uh, simplifying or in a way you can connect to the idea of reducing the knowledge. For example, there is a folk dance which is happening for eight hours or 10 hours in a specific context. But uh, we just went there and we liked some steps and we took those and we used it in our uh, choreographies. So there is no such way uh, where I could really help in addressing this uh, situation because it's still going on and very much um, there. And also how much they're benefiting. I mean, this whole concept of benefits because there are different levels of benefits and advantage when we, uh, we, we can talk. And uh, when we say about benefits, for example, yes, before uh, they were not um, on the social media or no one knew about them, but now people are talking about them or now they're having some performances um, here and there outside their villages, uh, apart that like they're farming as well as they're having some performances outside their villages and having an extra income. But, uh, but do we like, do I call it as a benefit? I don't think so. It's just some token of money uh, just to give them feel, make them feel that, okay, I think for you, like they're not even cared about them. But then on stage, they're giving some gifts and some saris and having a photographs with them doesn't uh, 
tell that, you know, they're really benefiting or these communities are really benefiting from this kind of work. So I hope I answered to you. So I think there is, uh, do you have any any uh, counter questions? Uh, you can. No, no, okay. no I, 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 I thank you very much for the explanation because usually very often we, we create things and then the, the actual community performers become uh, uh, marginalized uh, without our realizing it. But I think your explanation uh, about the complexities of, of doing artistic creation and dealing with communities, uh, I think it's something that we all have to um, think about, you know, and problematize whenever we are doing artistic creation. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. And uh, we have a question uh, from Christian. Um, I'm just, uh, okay. What is needed for decolonization in the dance forms discussed? This is for um, anyone can, uh, Malu, do you want to take or Faisal Thompson? I'm just trying to find the question here. Okay, I will, I will just post it again. I think that will, that will Before make that, sense. there's a question by um, Go Up Faisal. Yeah, just... there's a question by so don't skip. There's a question. Well, uh, Samson, let's let's uh, Malu read this question and but... maybe uh, yeah. If you uh, don't mind, um, um, do you wanna go for it or Faisal Samson? Anyone? What I was trying to say is that there is a question before that question by Christine. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Alabi. Uh, yeah, but I think uh, she, uh, Kristen uh, said that, uh, oh, maybe you just answered my question. So I think uh, Kristen's question kind of was answered through our answered. discussion. Okay. Yes, I think I found the question. It's, uh, I'm just wondering what interventions are needed to decolonize if the presentation so far shows how the process of decoloniality was a wedding place. What is needed for decolonization in the dance forms discussed? Uh, and this, any one of us can respond. So I'll try to uh, answer this question uh, through the things that I discussed in my presentation. Uh, I think when we are talking about these traditional dances in museum, uh, I think the first thing that it needs to happen to decolonize and I think for my presentation it was a little bit different because I was not talking about just the decolonization decolonizing the dance itself but how the dance can be a tool to bring discussions about decolonization in museums and how to put dance in museums can be a very problematic thing and also a very interesting thing for like there is this tension this both sides and I think the first thing that that needs to happen uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a really awareness of the mu by the museum uh, professionals or, or or to discuss the colonization because uh, or to bring the colonization to the to their activities because I think it is still something not so uh, I think they are kind of reacting to the things that are happening outside the museum. So in my interviews. And I had interviews, not just with people working in the museum in UK, but also when I was doing my food work in Belgium. And what I could notice is that they are kind of trying to react with, uh, about what's happening. So for example, there is the uh, um, Black Lives Matter movement. So they are trying to react. And when we are talking about repatriation, they were saying, okay, but we don't have any official uh, official request from these countries asking for their objects. And then the question is, okay, but do you need to, uh, you know the problem, you know the whole problem of colonization and the legacy of it. Do you need to really expect, uh, do you really just want to react to it or you want to be actually uh, an agent of this process? Uh, together, of course, with the, the community and the, uh, and people interested. So I think the first thing, it's not to act as a reaction, but also to, to, to assume this position of, uh, okay, well, we have this history and this legacy and how can we, we change it, not change it, but how can we bring this to the discussion and not just 
expect that others will bring this discussion and they will need to react to it. So I think for, from my point of view, that, that would be my answer. I don't know if others want to. Yes, um, I could add a little to that. Um, I think the question of decoloniality, it's still, it's, it's ongoing. It's, this is just the beginning, in my opinion. And um, because we or young artists or young um, scholars like us are still battling, especially me as a person from Nigeria, I'm still battling with some ideas. Um, there is still um, very few literatures by Nigerian scholars or African scholars on dances in Nigeria. There's still the question of repatriation. When I still want to notate my dance, I still have to use labor notation, which is quite complex for me. So there is still this, this, I, this question of um, what next? How far, how, how, how far can we push this idea of decoloniality? So I would, I would say that, of course, there are some measures, measures that have been put in place to decolonize, but this is not the end of it. And it is an ongoing process. Okay, um, so I have a question uh, for Samson and Faisal. Um, so it's, I, can we look, okay. So let me see for, it was from Kingsley. So he said like, I have enjoyed the uh, presentation, please. I have a suggestion. Can we look at how African music should be played only with African instruments rather than Western instruments? I'm of the opinion that we should be decolonizing instrument used in playing African music rather than decolonizing the music. I think that we should be thinking of decolonizing from Western instruments to African instruments for African music. So, yeah. Are you ready? I don't think this is a question per se because it's an uh, opinion that um, he has suggested and I totally agree with, with, with the person who um, sent this message. And of course, when we're talking about decoloniality, um, it's not just the dance forms, it's also the composite structure that makes the dance you know, um, realize. So when we talk about it, um, African music instruments or musical instruments are quite important, significant in the idea of, you know, uh, elevating um, the African um, music and dance form. So I do agree with um, your, your thoughts here. Yeah. And uh, we have a question. Let me just check. Um, Someone asked a question. From Solomon. From Solomon. Uh, as researchers who are interested, uh, yeah, as researchers who are interested in the recovery and reconstruction of dance knowledge and practice through decolonization strategies, according to your own experience as promoters of decolonization, what challenges can be faced as you are facing in promoting the decolonization of dance knowledge and practice, considering that the era of globalized networks is delivering many challenges to researchers interested in decolonization? Interesting question. Very interesting. <laughs> and Professor Chi Fang also have some questions. So let's first focus on uh, Solomon's and then we can. I think Samson has already touched on it briefly because when we talk about challenges um, as researchers, we here we are talking about you know, challenges within the academic um, circle and um, most of the literatures that we engage, for example, um, yeah, we, there are not a lot of you know literatures that talks about you know traditional dances. For example, in my country, we we, uh, we face this um, issue of you know limited literatures that speaks to you know um, African dance forms. So even the ways that we tend to analyze or um, um, think about you know methodologies are still really entrenched in Western you know, discourses. And that is where we tend to locate ourselves before we even go back home to you know, um, um, pursue any research. So the challenges here, um, I would say that from the academic circle, it's more of the, the literatures that, um, the lack of literatures that you know, we have, the lack of methodology. And one question that um, I tend to you know, ask myself, you know, for example, what, 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 um, what 
methodology, for example, can we use to analyze, for example, Ghanaian dance, Ghanaian dances, Ghanaian traditional dances, you know, if I want to analyze a dance form from Ghana, then I have to, you know, rely on Western tools like Laban notation, you understand? So it, it has to, you know, there's, it, it, there's a gradual process towards it, but we are not there yet. And these are some of the constraints that we find ourselves in. So from yeah. my perspective, this is what I will say, I will touch on. And maybe to add uh, on uh, on Faisal's comment, uh, because we in, we in our Indian dance, we do have certain uh, uh, grammars and certain code, uh, codes and uh, certain text which speaks about uh, the postures and the how the stage should be what will what the dancer should do and everything so but it's very difficult because when i'm talking through that vocabulary it is difficult for me to reach out so i think when we are talking about this whole concept of decolonization and then uh, when how do we incorporate those vocabularies and those uh, alternative way, uh, those methodologies um, while communicating with the rest of the world uh, while we are speaking. Because when I want to write something about my dance, I need to have like so many footnotes. So and I think this is also like an ongoing process and we need to uh, find out a common ground uh, for both uh, the discussion of the dance of the South Asian dance and uh, the European dance, in a way. And just to add a little bit in my presentation, my, my, my presentation, um, um, Emmanuel asked me a question about schizophrenia. And this is part of the challenge, you know, the la language itself to communicate one idea to the wider audience is also quite problematic. So for, it, schizophrenia does not really capture what I want to say here, but I need to, you know, get my idea conveyed closely to a concept that I believe will communicate to the wider audience. And this is in itself reducing the knowledge that I want to sort of communicate, you understand? So this kind of highlights some of the challenges that we tend to face. If we're talking about um, 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 this dance form that we presented, uh, Onikoku's um, art piece, um, dance form, which is spiritually centered, how do we methodologically, you know, highlight the spirituality that sort of, you know, um, encapsulates the dance form itself? You understand? So it's it's it, it's part of the challenges that we tend to, you know, think. But many a times we reduce it in some ways, and we talk about the movement, the sound, the 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 the, the, the music aspect. But the other forms that really hold the, the tension of the dance are not really addressed properly, or even if they are addressed, they are marginally addressed. And these are some of the things that we keep you know, asking or questions that we keep asking or thinking about. How do we kind of, in totality, realize all these forms and communicate to the wider audience? So that is a little thing that I will also touch on that. Thank you. And uh, um, Professor Chi Fang, do we have questions? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for giving me the time. I'm so pr impressed with the panel. Uh, I do have a generalized uh, interest uh, because I realize you have all picked up one representative artist or uh, you know pe uh, group or organization to present your this discussion. And I don't know if that has been agreed upon because it's very interesting to see how individual artists and their works or training have been used as a, you know, the, the target to um, embrace this um, uh, probably common or mutually contrast idea of decoloniality. Uh, my first question is to uh, Sirada because I, I, I understand. Odyssey and uh, Bharatanatyam are considered distinctive genres in Indian classical folk dance form. But uh, as this very well-known uh, feminist Chandra Leka has done very similar thing, <laughs> in my view, uh, who had tried to, you know, um, deconstruct it, that um, uh, feminist uh, role in that uh, classical 
um, ritual and their the form itself. So, so apparently there has this kind of voice, not just in India itself, but also internationally. And how that legacy had, can be contributed or considered to contribute to the the one you are talking about, even you are talking focusing on different forms. So that's my first question to you. So it's you know the choice of representative artists and how they should have been contextualized in the longer history of discourse in, in terms of decolonization in that culture. So then my question to Malu will be, all right, we now have this very powerful dance creators, uh, choreographer who, has, who can uh, present her work in such powerful scene and then using that artist word to say, to, to voice out that, uh, you know, uh, criticism to the white gaze, then what then will, how do scholars position, as a scholar, how do you position yourself in that already um, strong and powerful, um, you know, uh, expression, no matter it's from artistic work or from her uh, explanation, what can scholars do in that process of performing uh, decolonization. And then my question to uh, Faisal and Samson is also, you have, you know, shown this our artist, but I'm a little alerted by the usage of the word technique, because this might be due to my lack of contextualized knowledge of the African scene, because I suppose in most of the villages, people share and then improvise they, uh, you know, develop whatever that's suitable for the uh, impromptu music expression to do the, whatever they are dancing with. Then technique, especially when you use it as a singular turn, for me, there's a set, you know, um, you know, set uh, way of expressing or discipline the body. And then the, what then for me, it, it's how somehow bring back to this another kind of center focuses on the technique and which I'm afraid <laughs> monopolize, monopolize this uh, a whole system of, which inc include knowledge, philosophy, techniques, and uh, I don't know. And so that's my question to uh, your perspective. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, so I will like to answer. Um, uh, when you speak about Chandralekha, Chandralekha's work is very different uh, what was uh, Bharatnatyam before. But when we, if we see her, uh, if I want to analyze her work, she is using different community practitioners from the community. So she is using a yoga practitioner. She wants to do yoga in her production. And she is using Kalari practitioner if she wants to show Kalari. So she's not just learning from them and then learning some bits and pieces and deconstructing it to stylize it. But she's using and she's calling it very, she's calling it and she's speaking aloud that this is Kalari and this is this form. But she's not generalizing that, okay, I'm doing a uh, tradition with, with, between a classical and a folk term or a martial art term, but she's identifying and giving space to each and every form. But in uh, Sharmila Biswas, she also identifies the practitioners. But uh, if you see her choreography, she's, like, she's also uh, trying uh, her way to give visibility to the folk traditional music and costumes and everything. But if we analyze, if we go more deep, then we see that her students are using those folk movements and they're not necessarily telling that this is this, but she's using this whole, um, uh, her choices to extend the vocabulary of Odyssey dance at the cost of transforming those movements taken from folk. So there is a big difference 
between uh, Chandralekha's work and Sharmila's work. So it cannot be even uh, compared uh, to look from that vision, uh, if, I, if I'm seeing as a practitioner and as a researcher. So there, these are the two different things. And uh, so for Sharmila, she is not telling that this is X, Y, Z, or uh, these folk traditions. She is fusing and then she's transforming each movement as per her aesthetic and she's stylizing it. So I hope I kind of answered your question. Okay, thank you. So maybe I can continue uh, if you are done, Shui? Yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. Uh, so first, maybe I can make a comment about how we are using like one example and one person to kind of discuss our topics. And I think this is something really important for us and for this panel. First, to discuss the distinction between the traditional and contemporary. That's something very important for the debate about the colonization. And, and I think bringing one person is also a way not to just uh, explain this historical and, and this whole structure, but also to, to show kind of uh, one possibility of challenging this, this scenario. So that's why we want to bring one person or one example, one, one uh, work specifically, because then we can discuss in a more concrete way strategies to decolonize. And about your question, uh, what scholars can do uh, related to my topic, uh, I first I want to say that uh, this work uh, by Sita Patel, she started uh, to think in this topic about museums and how museums are uh, making their exhibitions through their white gaze. She started this because as a dancer from India origin, living in UK, she started to see this as an individual and uh, for a long time, according to her, I had an interview with her. Her work was not political uh, at all, but then she started to, to notice some, uh, she started to be uncomfortable, for example, visiting museums and as a traditional dancer. So she started to question that. And this work is one example of this, uh, their political, her political approach to it. But currently she's working with a scholar called Alice Proctor and she has a project uh, where she's dealing with uh, uncomfortable uh, tours inside museums. So she's an art historian who is uh, going to museums and trying to propose a decolonial uh, way of visiting the museum. And currently they are working together for a project. So I would say what scholars can do uh, is first create, uh, is try to collaborate with artists and, and by doing this, I think we touched a very important thing for the decolonization that is to, to reach a wider audience. And I think that's the importance of performance or artistic work because us in academia, we are kind of talking among ourselves and we are not, it's very hard to put the, this debate for, for outside. And, and what artists are doing, they might be discussing this, but they don't have the place to discuss this because these whole institutions like museums and academia, they are not uh, allowing these people to come inside and speak by themselves. We are talking for, uh, about them. So I think this collaboration between artists and scholars are very important to decolonize our discourses. And I think as a scholar, I think what would be important for me is to create this bridge between what we are doing in academia and what practitioners or contemporary artists or traditional dancers are doing. Thank you, thank you. I agree with that uh, collaborative role, actually. Um, I would like to quickly respond, then I'll let Faisal finish. Um, I think the intention is not necessarily to monopolize, but again, the, the concept of the idea of Afrocentricity is that basically Africans or Nigerians have been decentralized from their own narrative. And the intention here is to put them in the center again of their own narrative. So um, under this Afrocentricity or Afro-contemporary dances, there will be several individuals. 
And again, I understand the idea of technique is quite complicated and what term should we use, what term should we not use? There is that old issue we can dive in. But first of all, the intention here or the starting point is to put Africans or Nigerian writers, Nigerian practitioners in the center of their own narrative. So with Kudus Onukeku, he has put the Yoruba philosophy in the center of his own work. He hasn't put himself in the center of his own work, but is the Yoruba philosophy. So, of course, there are many Yorubas. I'm a Yoruba boy. There are so, several of us. We can dive into this idea of Afrocentricity or dive into this Yoruba philosophy and build our own knowledge from it. And I don't think it is necessarily monopolizing or putting himself in the center again, but giving us something to tap energy from, taking us back to our root and not necessarily taking us back, but letting us reflect based on our root. All right. Sorry. All right. Um, the question about technique, um, this is where it gets quite tricky. Um, perhaps I should have used the word approach you know, towards um, conceptualize. And in my presentation, I did mention that um, in Onikuku's um, uh, um, center, dance center, there's this idea of, um, not idea per se, but there's a discussion and that goes on in creating the, the dance form. So um, a way to sort of capture what happens um, is what I closely relate to the idea of technique. And technique is not just him, realize or giving um, 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 practitioners what to do. It is about practitioners sort of um, bringing out their experiences as a way of reflecting on their own selves in order to you know, create something. And in that sort of creative moment is what I sort of capture here as the technique, but it does not um, represent the similar understanding of technique that we can find in, for example, um, contemporary dance forms or you know, uh, Western dance form that are quite of structured in a certain you know, discipline. No, not in that form. The technique here, which I use closely um, or loosely, um, it does not reflect the Western idea of technique, but perhaps I should have used the word approaches, and that approach is you know, a collaborative process that individuals re um, reflect on, them, on their inner selves bring out their own ideas and feeling thoughts towards you know the creative or creation of a dance process so i hope i have kind of you know touched on that yes thank you very much i understand there must be some more sensitive and localized strategies to develop that kind of framework but i was just thinking that you know we tend to think that uh freedom technique, innovation, those things mm, um, automatically mean um, decolonization or, you know, some kind of deism. But actually, it might also lead to another trend of centralization. So, but, um, you know, but in the long run, I would say that modernism or modernity also provide that kind of self-destructive <laughs> process of, uh, you know, any ism. So, uh, but I'm sure. Um, thank you very much. It's just insightful. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, questions from Natalia, but I'm not sure whether uh, she's, I think she left. Or would you like to answer, um, Faisal or Malu? Samson? My brother Wayne, Marilio. <laughs> How my, do you? My honorable yeah. Zip brother. <laughs> Kai. <laughs> All right. So um, I will just touch briefly. Right. You know, Afro um, um, pop music. Here, um, I would say pop music is not. Well, it's, it's, it's quite complicated, really, to be honest with you. It's very com complicated to just associate it with, with as a result of colonialism. You know, I, it's, it's very complicated to start from that. But what I know here in Ghana is that, um, for, and I'll speak from pop perspective, for pop dance, Afro pop dance perspective, I'm not really grounded in pop music, but pop dance um, started as, you know, community reflection, you know, the uh, uh, um, uh, urban challenges that, you know, individuals go through and they want to communicate their, their grievances to the public. And that is when um, Afro 
pop or pop dance sort of you know um came about so it's it's the challenges there sort of when you when you think about classism you know the the lower class not getting access to you know basic resources amenities living in urban slums and whatnot how do they sort of you know um um come together in order to you know grieve and that's sort of became the 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 the, the foundation for what we consider today afro pop you know that is how it started so it's it's a way of you know expressing their grievances letting their and their mode of dancing were loaded with symbolic communication so it's not just re, um, expressing movement but really shooting ideas about what they feel so if you do movement that relate to boxing when afro pop azonto and let me put that we started with like azonto when azonto came azonto was basically about you know how the the the, the urban accra boy who is within the slum community or slum boxing community expresses his grievances so of course Colonial, colonialism has attached to it, but it is not directly related because after the remnant of colonialism, a whole lot of transformation has gone on. And even when you talk about the internal dynamics, politicians also, you know, pick up on this um, remnant of colonialism to also suppress. And, you know, it's not just Western, you know, um, um, national, you know, um, contradiction, but even internally, things like, you know, oppression, suppression also goes on. And this Afropop, so the reason why it probably became a big thing because everybody could relate, you understand? And of course, mass media also really helped because Africans on the continent were shooting, oh, sorry, not shooting, <laughs> were, were, were realizing their movement. And, you know, I, I, and diaspora also responded because those in diaspora also felt it. If you are in Europe, African being in Europe, it's not you having that freedom. Of course, you are you are living here, but you're not, you know, really fitting. So that grievances were also, you know, um, um, uh, were received. And that became that global phenomenon. Azonto or Afropop really becoming popular, coming to the Western world um, 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 and also becoming popular among the Africans in diaspora and then bringing it back to the continent. That is where, I would say made it popular, but in terms of as a result of colonialism, I am quite, you know, um, not really comfortable with saying it's because of colonialism. Like there are a whole lot of, you know, processes that has gone on. Yeah, thank you. Um, Torvald wants to comment. Okay. Um. Yeah, would you mind to unmute yourself? Uh, no, um, you need to unmute. Uh oh. Yeah. You, you what are you talking with, with me? Uh, yeah, Torvald. Torvald, I think. Um, ah, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you so much. We can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Mute. No. Yes, now we can hear you. You can hear me. Can, yes, yes. Good. <laughs> so I have been to uh, Orissa 1977 to do a documentary about this Mahari. And uh, I had a French camera called Beaulieu. It was the professional in those days. And uh, it started, it did not work and it could not be repaired in India at that time. But I saw a little about, there was one, she was the leader of this five Maharis that still was uh, alive. Her name is Hari Priya Devi. And she did little dances for me. And uh, so I was thinking now this we saw with Sharmila, which was documentary as you can call it but if you see that uh, when she's dancing old woman it's not much of dance you see actually and the question is what has happened historically is that we come across these few maharis still alive when they are old and 
how much one can re reconstruct of what was the Mahari tradition from this. We only get to know very little, actually. And it has been in decay for many decades when we get in contact with that kind of dance. So then this revival is in India. You want to go to the root. Uh, <clears throat> but as uh, Sri Radha already told, they bypass the Maharis. But even if you don't do it, what you get, you only get to get to know something that exists at this time. How was it 100 years back? It was maybe something totally different. So then, when you construct it with the Maharis, uh, this kind of ethnographic little amateur research as it was, or without them, uh, and then you call it, it was their tradition. Everyone tells like that in India. It goes back to the Mahari, it goes back to the Mahari, but no one knows what it really was. And uh, I also don't <laughs> know, even I've been to study. Uh, so this is my reflection uh, now. Uh, what happened historically in India is that all women dancing in all temples disappeared. And I was told to be prostitutes and things like this. And so this is also part of the historical process that everything has become masculinized in India very much, or, or in all respects. Uh, so it's all, not only with this, with dance, it's everything. And this is a question, is this decolonization that is the most important or is it to deconstruct the patriarchy that has taken over in India? Maybe it belongs together. So my question is then, Sharmila's reconstruction, is it more reconstruction than the already established so-called reconstruction? Is just another form of colonial construction. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Um, so it is not the, fa I'm not talking from the dance movement or the dance style perspective. I'm talking how the decision or the choices when uh, the reconstruction process was happening and then the Jayantik Association was formed by the male uh, intellectuals and the male uh, uh, researchers and the male gurus. And they were very much present in the temple, but nobody cared uh, to even ask their opinions uh, regarding the reconstruction process, how it should look or how the costume should be. So it was always via, via through the male gurus because it was one of the guru who is, his name is Guru Pankaj Charandash. His, he learned this Mahari dance from his aunt when he was a young boy. And then he was the voice of the Maharis. But the Maharis were very much present in the temple. So why not ask them and why not, uh, uh, why not involve them in the whole reconstruction process? So this was my uh, whole idea of presenting uh, this topic. But at the same time, um, yeah, I mean, what Sharmila is doing is not like um, she is going to the roots or looking back to the tradition, but she is curious about uh, the history of Odissi dance. And so she is trying to stylize it, stylize it based on different folk traditions of Orissa and going back to the temple dances and researching and asking and try to construct with them and not exclude them. Mm. Yeah. Any more questions or any comments? I think we are kind of- I, like... I think your presentation was very good. Thank you so much. Yes, compared with what I've seen <laughs> before. It was very clear. Thank you. So any any more um, questions or comments or 
maybe we can end the session. I think I think Malu posted a comment in her presentation, and also um, it's what I think here is not just about you know responding to questions, but also what our audience think when we are kind of approaching you know series of questions that we've already you know highlighted. So if any of the audience can also um, bring out remarks, it will be really important, especially as um, students in, uh, and young researchers here. So we will, I really appreciate your, 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 your remarks and what you also think about this whole notion of um, decoloniality. Thank you. Uh, can I address Malu? Hello. 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 Yeah, I, yes. I was thinking about this with museums when you took it up. I've been to and collaborated a little with this dance museum in Sweden. So I remember I was there with a dance drum about female infanticide and we performed it in the mm -hmm. museum. So they have this uh, mon different uh, uh, different countries. There. So there is one mon there was one Bharatanatya, this Indian dance that I remember. So they put up these wax dogs with dresses and things like that. And I think that this is like the wax cabinet. It's totally dead. I mean, this is not the way to, I hope they have changed it <laughs> nowadays. Maybe it's the same in the dance museum, but this is like very colonial, in my opinion. You put things like, and this is about 15 years back. So now we will go, uh, Sri Radha and me will go to Stockholm. So I will see, have they changed the museum? Or is it this still this old fashion, you know, to put everything in boxes? Dead. It's dead also. It should be alive in the museum. They should have artists in the museum, in my opinion, who, who do the different uh, uh, dances from different parts of the world and, and not this dead boxes. It's, it's like, it's a, how, how does it look? I mean, you maybe have seen much more of this in the world, how they represent dances from different parts of the world in museums. Is it like this still? Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, but then there is, uh, because there are so many problems on that. For example, first there is this problem that dance might be represented in the museum as something uh, frozen in the time. So when we are talking about dance in the museum, you have the costumes, you have uh, maybe pictures or maybe videos. Uh, but even videos, it's a way of uh, frozen this this uh, the performance. So this is one uh, problem of this uh, this discussion. Mm -hmm. And the other problem that I wanted to address with my presentation is, okay, so we can have dance inside the museum and we can have traditional dances inside the museum, but then what's the other problem with that? Because of course we can show the, uh, the live aspect of the performance and the dancers and everything. But, but then when we are talking about decolonization, like what kinds of uh, strategies or actions the dancers and the museum, the institution, should take to guarantee, not guarantee, because of course we don't have, you cannot guarantee anything, but to, uh, to address uh, problems related with exotification or because also to just put their that dancers, that dancers uh, in front of the display, it also can be problematic. And that's that yeah, problem yeah, that yeah. I wanted to... They become museum point. pieces in the museum because the yes, museum itself yes. is a institution of a certain era. Like you see, like here in Sweden and many other countries, they have to collect houses in the 19th century, this movement was. Uh, you collect old houses in a, a museum. Like Stockholm, there is something called Skansen and here in South Sweden also. But then it's, I mean, it, it's dead somehow. <laughs> it's it's okay. not alive. Uh, so, so how how you think? How should you represent, say, from Brazil, 
to dance in Sweden. Should you totally dispense with a museum, actually? Okay. So I would like to jump in here. Because <laughs> we are kind of running, um, uh, we are kind of behind uh, a bit, and uh, maybe we can have this conversation later. I can share Malu's email ID, probably you already have. So we can have another short discussion on this. <laughs> And uh, thank you so much um, for being so supportive. And as already Faisal told that we are students and we are trying in our own ways to put our uh, voices uh, and uh, talk about this uh, topics, which we feel are very crucial and important to address. And as, as, as a dance student and as a practitioners, I think we ha are trying to address this, uh, this uh, topics and uh, it's thank you so much for your support and I think it was great and thank you and we can end the session here thank you so much thank you bye thank, thank, thank you, you.